Testosterone is the hormone of desire. Desire to change the world, to do things that matter. What we have now is we have an epidemic of men and women with lower testosterone than they're supposed to happen. It makes you weak. It makes you programmable. It makes you just not give a shit about life. And I know, because I've been there. First and foremost, I want to talk to you about red light therapy. All right. What Number one, what is it? And what are some of the benefits that you're seeing with red light therapy? All right. Red light therapy is one of the many different kinds of light therapy. And people thought this stuff was crazy. If you go back about 20 years, no one thought lights did anything except for blue lights for kids who had jaundice. But if you scrap all that and you go back to the 1920s there was a vibrant practice of light therapy even in major hospitals and it got erased by big pharma so what happened is in the late 90s early 2000s there was one study showing what infrared light did to mice brains and an unknown inventor created a little infrared light device that you could put on your brain. And I had one of maybe 200 that were invented. And I used it to fix my brain from toxin-induced brain damage, from TBIs, uh, from just all this mold problems, chronic fatigue, just all sorts of nasty stuff. So I was having a really hard time paying attention. It made a massive difference for me. And that inspired me to create my company called True Light that uses four different types of light. But infrared, it turns out, has one set of things. You can't see it, so people think, oh, it's just red light. But most light therapy devices are red plus infrared. So what red light's doing, it's increasing collagen thickness, it's speeding wound healing, and it's adding electrons directly to your body. So you get this great anti-inflammatory effect. But layered on top of red, you have infrared, which changes the structure of water so that your cells can work better and more effectively. And what I do with true light is I actually add a specific wavelength of amber that's shown to help with small blood vessels. So it turns out different lights penetrate different depths. And when you treat yourself with this, you see massive improvements in mitochondrial respiration or the way your body makes energy. This I'm so glad to have you here because I have a friend who just got this really incredible infrared light bed. Mm -hmm. At his, he he owns a gym and also he's doing some some accompanying services as well. And he's been using it. He's like, and my wife pointed out like he his his body fat has gone down. He's lost a little yeah. bit of weight. And he's like, I'm not doing anything differently. I'm just using this infrared light therapy. You'll, so now it's starting to make sense. You'll see it. And there are infrared saunas, which you, know, you and I both know about. And they're using different frequencies of infrared. It turns out there's near, there's medium, and there's far. And some of the really good saunas have a mix of all of those. Yeah. But now we can have LED lights. So at my biohacking franchise company called Upgrade Labs, it's created that whole idea of a facility with light therapy and many other biohacks in it. I opened the first one eight years ago underneath Arnold Schwarzenegger's office down there in Santa Monica. We chatted about it last time. Well, now it's a franchise. You go to ownandupgradelabs.com and people can open one anywhere. We've got, surprisingly, a light bed that's from True Light that has amber, infrared, and two shades of red with specific fluctuations in it. So it's you land that thing for 20 minutes and you're like, what just happened? Well, what happened is, in your friend's case, when you get that infrared light, your cells have a hard time making extra energy and where does the energy come from well you take 30 pounds of air and some amount of either fat muscle or something you ate and you convert that into electricity it just turns out infrared makes it so the body can do that more easily mm. and when that happens well of course the body says now i have what it takes to burn this extra fat and in your friend's case it might not even have been fat it might have just been inflammation because when you have inflammation, that's extra water in your cells. Well, you change the water, you make the cells work better. People feel profoundly better from infrared light. Wow, this is so powerful. You know, and you're already ahead of the curve as you typically are on a lot of things with light being so therapeutic in so many different ways. But one of the things that's really rising to the forefront right now, the gut is having a moment. We just <laughs> yep. talked with Robin Chutkin, but 
light and circadian medicine specifically is having a moment right now and really rising to the forefront. So I just want to point out, when I used to hear this, I really thought it was a soft science when people would say things like circadian rhythms, <laughs> right? And so to understand that these are functional genes and proteins, when we talk about these biological clocks in our cells that are syncing up with the 24 hour solar day, like it's syncing our bodies up with all of nature. And what's shown in the data, the thing that's connecting or syncing up that system the most is our exposure to different light. I'm so happy you said the most in that sentence. People have been just saying the craziest stuff because I wear true dark glasses. This is, yes, another one of my companies and I have no problem talking about the stuff I make. Look, if I believed in it enough to make something I couldn't buy, maybe it's real, I, I think it is. And if you don't buy the glasses, you're lost, not mine. <laughs> so here's the thing, there's five things about light that matter. And I ended up writing some of the patents for the glasses even. And here's what matters. There's the color of light. And it turns out there's four colors of light that set your circadian rhythm. It's not just blue. And this is a major thing to understand. So if you're wearing blue blocking glasses, you're doing it wrong. And I'm gonna tell you why. But after that, there's the angle of the light and there's the intensity of the light. And you'll see Andrew Huberman, who's got tons of great biohacking uh, content. He's talking about how, well, the color of light doesn't matter. Well, it does, but intensity also matters. So what the glasses that I wear before I go to sleep do, which is different than these day ones, they block all four colors and they block light from a certain angle and they block the intensity of the light, which just knocks you on your butt. And I'm about to release a university validated paper showing that the true dark glasses induce the same brain state as meditation just by wearing them using EEG. We, we've done a huge amount of data gathering of brain waves from 40 years of Zen, which is my brainwave, you know, brain training upgrade center in Seattle. So I have neuroscientists, I have all this gear. It's like, mm -hmm. we're going to actually see what light does to brain waves. And we have got a seminal paper on this, but here's the thing. I wear partial blue blockers during the day when I'm indoors. So I'm in your studio, you've got some LED lights up here. They're relatively rich in blue. You're smart because you're wearing a hat, so you get a little bit of shade from those. And what I'm doing is I'm blocking toxic blue, but I'm letting good blue in, like good blue. During the day, if you wear blue blockers, you get no blue light and your body doesn't get a wake up signal and your metabolism doesn't rev up the way it's supposed to. This is why when you wake up, you go outside without glasses, without contacts, and you get 20 minutes of light. Now, some people are saying, oh, glasses and contacts don't matter. They're missing the fact that UVA and UVB, ultraviolet light we can't see, it does have a specific metabolic effect inside the eye. So what happens? Light's coming into the eye, and you imagine two billion years ago, there's bacteria floating in the ocean. Those are your mitochondria. They are now inside our cells, but they're still running that old bacteria operating system. They don't really have clocks in them because they're dumb bacteria. They don't have room for a clock in there. So what do they do? They go, hmm, I can see the angle, intensity, and color of light, and I can set my clock. Why do they need to set their clock? Because they're not alone. They work with each other. So they all need to know what time it is. And right now, the mitochondria in your liver needs to know the same time of day as the one in your brain. And the central clock that controls those is called the SCN in the eye. And 5% of the cells in your retina are cells that collect light, but you never get to see that light because it doesn't go in your optic nerve. It goes directly to the SCN and it tells that part of your brain, hey, centralize, tell everyone this is what time of day it is. So that's kind of cool, but that's not all that controls our circadian timing. Okay, if that's the first signal, you wanna guess what the second signal is? Food. You nailed it. And that's because, gee, in the middle of the day, in fact, two o'clock would be the, the top time, is when there's the most algae available because it's been growing all morning and that's when there's most food availability for these dumb little mitochondria. This is why eating after the sun goes down is provably bad for your metabolism, right? So we're just saying, hey, okay, if the first thing is, the angle, intensity, and color of light. The second thing is the timing of food. It doesn't even matter what kind of food it is at that point. What do you think the third thing is? Beats me. Well, it is 
probably physical activity. I was going to say that, but it was too obvious. Yep. Gee, what's too the obvious. best time to work out? Two o'clock is the best time to work out at the end of a fast and then eat a whole bunch because that just completely builds a big spike around your circadian rhythm, right? And then we go on one from there. And it turns out after physical activity, it's temperature. Mm, yeah, because it gets colder when it gets darker. Right, no matter where you are on the planet. And, yeah, that and, happens. And what is co- it turns out infrared is heat, and cold is the opposite of that. Mm. So you want it to be cooler at the first half of the night, and that gives you more deep sleep. And the second half of the night, you want it to be not too hot, not too cold, which gives you more dreams. We understand all this now, but when I first started wearing my cool True Dark glasses. <laughs> People are like, what are you training to be a rock star? I'm like, no, I'm just training to not weigh 300 pounds anymore. And I'm training to have a brain that works all the time and to not have sugar cravings by the end of the day because my brain is tired from filtering out junk light. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's really important. But since food is such a big thing, intermittent fasting has been a big part of the Bulletproof diet for more than a decade now. And it's you know, become a, a much more known thing than it used to be. But when you stack light, and food availability, and you use tools like coffee and minerals, all of a sudden, wow, my metabolism works to the point that your body just makes energy without needing a lot of substrate. Like I I was just showing you before the show, my blood sugar, I've got the new levels monitor, I'm at 65 right now. Now, people would say, you're gonna die, and it's like red alert, it's like, oh no, you're gonna, no, I'm not actually gonna die, I'm intermittent fasting right now and my body's just fine, my brain is just fine, and I'll eat when I want to eat, and this works. Yeah, oh man, I love it. You know, and again, being able to see your blood sugar management, and you also moved it from having it on your arm to placing it on your on your stomach. Yeah. That's really interesting as well. So again, there's so much diversity. This One of the things I really admire about you is your, your audacity to test things and to experiment it's at such a high level. And by the way, Levels, my favorite continuous glucose monitor. Oh, so good. Go to levels.link forward slash model. That's levels.link forward slash model for a great hookup over there. And just the team of people, you're involved with them and um, you know, just top-notch people. The thing about it too is not just the accuracy and the technology use, but the data points that they extract and the content they create around that with education and empowerment super powerful but i want to ask you about this as well and thinking about in terms of the timing of certain things to line up with these circadian uh, rhythms so we we talked about uh, physical movement we talked about the intake of food we talked about light exposure what about sex is there an optimal time in this circadian timing system for that and there's a reason i'm asking this question we're going to get to in a moment you know i i think about every three hours is the right increment for that of course <laughs> of course that's that's what the, that's exactly what i was looking for <laughs> there you go problem solved up next every now, three hours now there's there's some arguments about this uh, there's a famous book i interviewed the author probably one of my first hundred guests uh, called sex at dawn um, which is an argument that humans are are biologically adapted to not be monogamous. So you could say morning is good, and there's some pretty clear indications that we're wired to do that uh, as men, because you, you wake up with a kickstand if things are working right. So there you go. Uh, but uh, that doesn't always work. So I think the most important thing is actually that you do have sex regularly. And if you have young kids, you have to put it on your calendar and just do it whether you feel like it or not, because it's a critical part of keeping a relationship alive. And there's a lot that has to do with testosterone ranges. Uh, Some of my books, particularly Game Changers, I talk about the change in hormones in women, but also in men that come about from sex. And with men, when you ejaculate, there is a massive drop in testosterone for two days afterwards. And I tried to disprove that. I tried to disprove the, you know, ejaculating too often is bad for you thing. I failed to prove it. In fact, I proved that that there's a case for semen retention. And I think that's a really good practice to learn how to have sex and not ejaculate. If you're having sex every day, it will deplete you as a man. There's just no way around it. Now, the reason that I brought this up was a bigger conversation, which is a conversation around infertility. And it's so fascinating that at this time in human history where 
again, on the surface, we seem to be so evolved and so intelligent and all this innovation in science. And yet there are many different pockets and different populations of folks where we're seeing infertility rates increasing as our so-called innovation is increasing as well. Something is clearly off here in this equation. So can you talk about our current situation with infertility? Sure. My very first book was called The Better Baby Book, and it was a book on fertility. It took me five years to write it. My wife at the time was infertile. She's a medical doctor, uh, trained at the Karolinska Institute, and her colleagues said, well, so you're not going to have kids. I'm like, we can biohack that. So we put together the nutrition program, detoxing, all that stuff, restored her fertility, had one child at 39 and one at 42. And that was with no IVF and no uh, outside treatment, just from lifestyle modification. So that book has had, it's helped thousands of people conceive, even though it's now what, 12 years old. And I studied a lot. My conclusion at the end of that book was that we do not have a population problem just wait (laughs) because our fertility rate is plummeting and most developed countries are having kids up below the replacement rate. Japan lost 600,000 people from their population last year as they aged out and no one was there. They have entire cities in the countryside where no one lives in the houses anymore. They're just abandoned. So yeah, we don't have a population problem. We have a fertility problem and it's caused in large part by chemicals and circadian disruption. One of the things, if you wanna get pregnant, make sure that the woman's circadian rhythm and the man's, so we can make good swimmers, are synchronized with the sun. In fact, isn't that weird? Aren't women supposed to have their cycle with the moon? Yeah, they are. We also have chemical birth control for women, which is a terrible crime against women. Birth control is necessary for women, but chemical birth control is causing huge health problems in women, and we're not telling them about it. It it changes their brains, it changes their biochemistry, and something that you don't hear about very often, but something that is, is very, very powerful. All mammals use pheromones to communicate. And the way men work is that when we smell unconsciously is our meat operating system doing it. It's not like you're choosing to. When we smell a fertile woman is around us, we get done. Hmm. And when our bodies believe that we're in a world that is devoid of fertile women, it's totally fine to play video games in grandma's basement for your entire life. Hmm. Since 85% of women use chemical birth control, hormonal birth control at some point in their life versus all the other methods that work as well but are safer for women, I think it has a negative effect on men as well because there's a a sacred interaction between men and women and a lot of it is unconscious. And I'm not talking about just your partner being fertile. I'm just saying if you walk through the park and there's fertile women around, your body knows. And it goes, ah, I guess society is continuing. But if it doesn't know, then society isn't continuing and you lose your testosterone, you lose your vibe for life. So there's something nefarious going on there. That's not even talking about plasticizers and glyphosate, which is we just showed in studies now in mammals. Glyphosate, the stuff they're spraying on food everywhere, is increasing the space between the vagina and anus, basically a bigger perineum, which is a sign of pushing towards androgyny. So we really don't want anyone from this point forward ever again to use glyphosate, especially on our food, but anywhere on the planet. This stuff is actively harmful and it's harmful for a long time and it's destroying our soil, it's destroying our fertility, it's destroying our kids. It's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, it's so crazy that we're still even having this conversation with, especially over the last couple of years with the WHO kind of emerging as this intelligent body of of science. Right. Who, I, who accused him of I being know. intelligent? I, I know, I know. Oh. Who? WHO. <laughs> but classifying glyphosate as a carcinogen, right? So a cancer-causing agent, and yet this, this is still something that's cycling through our food cycle in such a big way. It's, it's so crazy to me. The thing is, economics drives everything. It just does. And 
people use glyphosate because it's cheaper than weed killers. But we have giant tech companies right now that are as powerful as the chemical companies. Guys, make me weed killing robots. That is a trillion dollar industry that would preserve soil and you can have all of Monsanto's profits. I'm down with that. Solar powered robots that pull weeds instead of people, no more glyphosate ever again. And that would change human fertility, but it's gonna take 30 or 40 years to fix the damage we did. That's important because we have 60 years of topsoil left on the planet. And a side effect of all this, by poisoning the soil, in fact, glyphosate poisons earthworms at 300 times less than the allowable limit. Earthworms have seizures when they're in soil like that, so you can't have earthworms making good soil. It, this is truly a bioweapon. But what happens with glyphosate is that it takes all the minerals out of the soil. It's actually a uh, accumulating agent. So they spray glyphosate on your grains to make them ripen early so they can harvest sooner. And then of course you get all that. What that means is that your food is devoid of minerals and what minerals are in it are already locked up. Plants lock up minerals anyway using something called phytic acid and oxalic acid, which is present in kale and spinach and stuff like that. Uh, and they do that because animals need minerals to make energy and to live. So if you eat a lot of plants, the plants are like, well, I couldn't run away, so I'm just gonna poison you slowly so that you won't eat too many of me because I don't like it when you eat my babies. That's the plant consciousness, right? So we're having this dance, but our soil has no minerals, so our plants have no minerals, and then we spray poison on them that locks up the minerals, and then we're mineral deficient. Mm -hmm. And that's why Danger Coffee, which is my new coffee brand, it's full of trace minerals to put back what is not in your food anymore. If you're eating grass-fed animals from good quality soil, you're probably getting minerals, especially if you eat the organs. Very few of us do that on a regular basis. So what does that mean? It means that everyone is lacking in trace minerals. And when you put those back in, your metabolism works better, you're more fertile, you sleep better, and you literally can make more electricity all the time. Yeah. And that's why people feel different when they drink dangerous coffee. Like, why do I like this? You like it because your body, the unconscious parts of you, the same parts of you that smell pheromones, are like, yeah, I gotta get motivated. They're like, there's minerals in here, drink that. And then you feel different because you got electrolytes and you got ionic minerals. So that's the, the deal with dangerous coffee. I'm putting back something that's missing, which is restoring power at a different level. Yeah, and in a medium that is socially integrated into our culture. Yeah, right? you're, you're gonna do coffee every day. You might not take your vitamins every day, but you'll do your coffee every day. And that's why, like, danger beans, use those. So we covered a couple of the reasons because, you know, what's so fascinating as well is the fact that we have these outcomes seen and, like, infertility in particular mm -hmm. is what we're talking about. But it seems like this random occurrence, like, oh, infertility, what's going on, right? But there can't be... This is this is ignoring basic principles of causality. Like something yes. happened that's causing this outcome and the outcome is so pervasive that we need to address it seriously. We're talking about the continuation of humanity. And so one of those things you just mentioned again, it's our environmental pollutants, things that we're putting into the environment that we're eating food contaminated with these things or breathing the air, whatever the case might be. So but I wanna dig in a little bit more with food. How is food contributing to infertility? It's really straightforward. Most cells in your body have a few hundred to a thousand mitochondria in every cell. And people think of mitochondria as power plants of the cells, that's not real. What they are is environmental sensors and individual decision-making compute nodes. So each mitochondria says, huh, What's the world look like from a nutrient availability, from a timing, from a safety perspective? And it's a stupid little bacteria, but it's still doing its best. But it votes with all the other many billions of them throughout your body in something called quorum sensing. And based on that, your mitochondria decide what the world's like, and then they can make electricity, they can make sex hormones, they can make inflammatory molecules, and they can pretty much make any protein they want. So these are not power plants. These are sensors, decision makers and manufacturing plants that can make anything. And 
your brain and your heart have 15,000 of them per cell because those are the most energy dense parts of the body. But what no one talks about is that ovaries have 100,000 mitochondria per cell, far more than anyone else in the body. Why do they have that? Because they're making a very critical decision. Those mitochondria are deciding what the world looks like and they're selecting one of several billion eggs to pick the one that is going to thrive the most in the world that you live in today and they're deciding whether or not there's going to be any egg because if the world is unsafe or there is not enough energy and not enough nutrients including minerals not enough of the right fats to have a baby that's likely to survive the best thing for the mother is to not have any baby and you get infertility that's why what you do for six months before you get pregnant or at least three months is critically important you want to show your mitochondria that you live in a place with lots of sunshine without too much stress with all the minerals all the best fats all the egg yolks the fish eggs grass-fed meat oysters all this stuff you're swimming in abundance and safety so you can select a world-class egg that's ready to thrive instead you could be eating a plant-based diet. You could be over-exercising. You'd be limiting your calories. You could be staying up late under artificial blue light. And if you can get pregnant, which you'll be able to do when you're very young, usually, you know, Mother Nature wants you to have kids when you're 24, even though that doesn't work well societally or from a personal development perspective. Uh, but if you do that, you might get away with it. But if you wait till you're in your early 30s when you can afford a kid, where maybe you've done enough therapy that you're ready to have a healthy family and be a good parent, it gets harder and harder because of what we're doing to the environment. And that's the conundrum. You want to be vibrantly healthy for the woman. For the guy, it's important because a large amount of infertility is coming from men. But we replace our swimmers a lot more often <laughs> than women with their eggs. So for guys, I like to see six weeks of cleaning up their act. Or ideally, six months is better. But within six weeks, you can radically improve sperm quality, sperm motility, and that provably lowers the risk of having um, birth defects and other problems and just infertility issues. Um, it's also worth noting that in animal agriculture, we know that if you have food that's contaminated with mold toxins, that it increases infertility and it increases stillbirths dramatically to the point that they feed extra clean mold-free food to pregnant animals or animals that are mating. But when the animals are not mating, they feed the animals more moldy food, even though the mold accumulates in the animals, then we eat them. This is one more reason to go grass-fed because they'll feed the moldiest grains to the chickens and cows before they slaughter them. It's bad for us, bad for our fertility, because many of the mold toxins are xenoestrogens that are thousands of times more estrogenic than human estrogen. In fact, you might know about this. This is a little known thing in animal agriculture. I can say this because I live on an organic farm that we built from the ground up, right? If you want to make a cow fat, with 30% less calories. Oh, by the way, that's supposed to be impossible if you listen to all the calorie, like health influencers, like just, you know, you can drink a diet soda and eat potato chips as long as you're on the treadmill. Dude, screw you guys. It, it's so wrong. So, all right, I'm gonna calm down for a second here. But <laughs> there's a drug called Xeranol, and it's based on a mycotoxin called Xeralanone. And it's one of those estrogens. You put a little wax pellet in a cow's ear and it'll melt and it'll be absorbed through the, the blood vessels in the ear, and that cow will get fat on 30% less calories. What the hell is in that pill? Well, it's a synthetic estrogen, except it's not really synthetic. It's a natural estrogen from toxic mold. That same toxic mold may be growing in your house. There's about 100 million structures in the US that have toxic mold problems that are massively contributing to infertility in people, and they don't know it. That water leak in your ceiling, that funky smell in your bedroom, no wonder you're having all sorts of health problems and you can't get pregnant. We know this from animal agriculture. We're animals too. So controlling your environment is important. Now, you could say, Dave, what the heck are you talking about? Look, I believe in this stuff a lot, Sean. So moldymovie.com is a totally free documentary on toxic mold that I funded and filmed with a professional crew going around the country interviewing doctors and people have been affected by mold the same way I was. This is a part of the equation that we don't talk about enough. 
to do something about it instead of complain about it and raise awareness, which doesn't do anything. My company, Homebiotic, makes a probiotic spray that you can spray around your house that counteracts mold. It's part of what's in soil to keep soil and bacteria working. It's what I spray around my house so that if there is moisture, I live in a tropic, well, it's not tropical, it's a rainforest, but it's a temperate rainforest up in Vancouver Island. So I don't have mold problems indoors because I use that. Uh, from a light problem thing, <laughs> gee, uh, true dark makes my glasses, true light makes my light therapy. Danger coffee makes coffee with minerals. I start companies that solve these problems that make things I can't buy somewhere else. And that's me doing my best to change the world, not to go out there and make a bunch of money. Frankly, I'm tired of starting companies. I want others to start companies. That's why we both work with levels. There's so many problems that need solving. It's entrepreneurs' jobs to solve them. And if I see one more of the, what's her name, Greta Grundelberg, uh, the, the teenage person who's like, uh, whatever, a teenager, I'm very angry that someone should do something, so I will skip school to change the world. I'm like, I don't get it. Like, you, you think the oceans are a problem? Clean them up, right? There are people her age who have designed systems to clean plastic out of the ocean who are doing it. So my call to everyone listening to your show is don't, complain about things go start something solve a problem in a new way and get to it like we need to do this we don't have a lot of time yeah get to it you just said it so powerful so another one of these things you just brought up the use of xenoestrogens mold derived to increase the body weight of cows faster another one of those things is the systemic use of antibiotics as well man Antibiotics are just mold toxins. Let's be straightforward, at least most of them are. There's a few chemical ones. So the vast majority of them are penicillin. And people say, Dave, how could mold be causing such a thing? It's just mildew in my bathroom. Mildew is a marketing word for mold. They're the same thing. And here's the thing, that tiny little antibiotic pill you take, how does that have such a profound effect on your body? Well, it turns out breathing stuff is more effective than swallowing it for delivering things. And if you're in a moldy bedroom, for instance, one of the things that will happen is that the bacteria mix in your sinuses will change and you'll get strep throat or chronic sinusitis all the time. And we're showing more and more, like our friends at Viome are doing this, that your oral and your sinus microbiome directly and profoundly affects the bacteria in your gut. So what's going on here is you breathe antibiotics, you change what's going on up in here, and it changes what's going on in your gut, your gut bacteria shift, and it reduces fertility, it increases obesity, it changes even how you dream, and it sets off systemic inflammation that's very similar to what people are getting even from long COVID. It, it's mast cell overactivation. So it's, it's a very interesting scenario, but bottom line is eat less toxins, breathe less toxins, clean your water, turn your lights off at night, and don't eat plant-based franken food, you'll probably be okay. It's not the end of the world. These things aren't that hard. Yeah, man. I want to touch on one more aspect with the infertility. Uh, this study, and this is just leading into another subject here. This study was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and they found that young men, young men who put themselves in a sleep debt for just one week under these award study for just one week, Getting five hours of sleep per night saw their testosterone levels drop by up to 15%. That degree of drop is as if they suddenly were 10 to 15 years older. And this was just in the, over the course of five nights of taking a few hours of sleep away per night. It happened that quickly where their testosterone began to plummet. Well, when I was 26, my testosterone was lower than my mother. And I was 300 pounds. When you have lots of extra body fat, um, that happens. When your cholesterol is low, that happens. When you eat a plant-based diet, that happens. And all these soy boys, uh, it's a serious problem because right now, testosterone levels in young men are probably 40% of where they were 50 years ago. That's without all the sleep debt. So if you're doing that, you're literally half the man your grandfather was. Or... You could do what I did when I was 26 under the advice of my anti-aging doctor. I started taking testosterone because my levels were so profoundly low. My thyroid was almost undetectable. I went on thyroid hormone. I had Hashimoto's and a bunch of other stuff. And I replaced my testosterone. And it brought my brain back online because what testosterone does is not, it's not about sex. It's not about being lean and ripped and all that kind of stuff. Testosterone is the hormone of desire. 
desire to change the world, to do things that matter. And when men have appropriate testosterone levels, they will build the Great Wall of China. They will change the world. They will go to the moon. And they'll do it pretty much for women <laughs> because we're wired with pheromones to do that. And when women have enough testosterone, which is a different level, it is also the hormone of desire. It's desire to do stuff that matters, right? And what we have now is we have an epidemic of men and women with lower testosterone than they're supposed to happen. It makes you weak. It makes you programmable. It makes you just not give a shit about life. And I know, because I've been there. You ever see Grumpy Old Men, the movie? It's yes, like, of course. It, yeah. It's a documentary on testosterone deficiency. That's what <laughs> people are like. You wonder why the world's like it is? Amp up testosterone in men and women, and suddenly we'd like each other again, and we'd like our lives a lot better. But that's not enough. Because if you're saying, well, I have desire now, but I'm too tired, you got to look at thyroid. And thyroid is tied back to minerals. That's one of the reasons I'm putting minerals in my coffee, because people are deficient in iodine. In fact, if we could just get the global iodine levels up, it would raise the global IQ by several points because iodine deficiency during pregnancy lowers IQ of children for life, even if you give them iodine later in life. So we've got to get our levels of iodine up, which affects thyroid. And so many people, because of what we've done to our soil, to our diets, to our lives, get Hashimoto's, which is when your immune system attacks your thyroid. If you're over 40, right now, the odds are substantial that you're slightly low on thyroid. Since thyroid is the hormone of energy, it's the thermostat for your body. It not only keeps you lean, it gives you energy. So when you come home from work and it might be five or six o'clock, you could say, man, I feel so good. I want to do something that matters. I'm going to play with my kids because I have the energy and the desire to do it. Or you could come home and say, I barely made it through the day. I'm so tired. I just need a beer right? You can pick. And it's not because you're a bad person. It's because you don't have the hormone that lit the fire or the one that made it hot. Those two hormones matter so greatly and they're influenced by your lifestyle. They're influenced by your sleep, by your diet, and by how many toxins you get. And if we can just make those a little bit better, or you can just take testosterone based on your lab test. Don't just go take it all willy nilly. You need to know your numbers. And I think there's an argument for everyone over 40 to get an advanced thyroid panel. And if your number's even a little bit low, start taking a little bit and you will live longer and you'll feel so much better. Having adequate thyroid hormone reduces your cancer risk and your cardiovascular risk dramatically. It is dirt cheap and it's widely available and it gives you your brain back. It, it lowers anxiety, lowers depression, and it makes you way more dangerous. Because the goal here, everyone listening to the show, I want to make them dangerous. What dangerous people do, they do whatever they choose because they have the power to do it. They might ask her out finally. They might ask for a raise. They might say no to something stupid. They might remove an antiquated sign warning about six feet distancing that was put up two years ago by a misinformed government drone. All that stuff. You can do that. If you have energy and you have desire, that makes you dangerous. And I am doing everything I can to make a world full of people who are peaceful and kind and can handle their because yeah. that's who I want around me. That's what I want my kids to grow up with. And I'm tired of weak, programmable, tired people. Get your testosterone, get your thyroid, get your minerals and stop eating fake plant-based foods. Just eat the real food and watch what happens. You might have to wear camo pants like Sean here. <laughs> Let's go. And you were going to wear your camo pants today, but there are some human remains on it. We're not going to share that story, but it's not what you think. It's not, it's not a bad story. But man, so powerful. I'm so grateful for that because what, what those who are in the know and people who are, who are expressing that drive and that activity are doing something, we can get into this place where we're starting to question, we're like, why aren't other people doing this stuff? It's not necessarily that it's not within their capacity. It's just harder. When you don't feel well, it's so much more difficult to be critical thinking, to yeah. perspective take, to take action. It It's not that people are, are weak or stupid, although there are weak and stupid people out there. It's mostly hardware problems. And this is what I ran into in my mid-20s. Uh, I'm, I'm going to Wharton Business School. Okay, I'm about to fail out of my classes. 
like, what is going on here? I thought I was smart. You know, I have this good career going on in Silicon Valley. And I went to one of Dr. Daniel Amen's physicians and he's like, uh, inside your brain is total chaos. You have mold toxin induced brain damage. I don't even know how you're standing here in front of me. I'm like, oh, thank God. I have a hardware problem. It's not that I'm stupid or weak or that I'm just not trying. And most people who are tired and aren't feeling the desire, like, God, I'm so exhausted right now. It's not you, it's your meat. Your meat has a problem. And those two hormones and minerals are likely the fastest fix, but it's not gonna work if you bathe yourself in glyphosate and you bathe yourself in blue light. You've gotta do those at least mostly right. I'm sure I have glyphosate in me because I'm alive, right? That's okay. but. If you just get those two hormones up, man, you're going to change your life. You get your mineral levels to where they would have been in 1936 instead of 2022. You're just going to look around and go, wow, I didn't know the world looked like this. Yeah. yeah. You know, what I was most surprised about, well, not most surprised about, but one of the things that really jumped out at me over the last couple of years was the overlooking of host defenses and doing things to make us more resilient as a species versus superficial things. You just mentioned one of them, this antiquated, and I just went to the gym uh, yesterday and I saw in the fitness room, like the aerobics room, there are the six feet apart stickers on the floor. Oh my God. Stay six feet apart, stay safe, right? And it's just not pulled out of the air, but almost just to make up a number, six feet, that's going to protect you. I, I was just down in Peru. And it was funny, in Lima, where it's crowded, it was one meter apart. And when I got to Cusco, it was 1.5 meters apart. Same country, different provinces, but clearly very rationality-based. And you get to other places, it's six feet or two meters. It's all just meat operating system, fear-based stuff in people. It doesn't make any sense anymore, given what we know now. So I would encourage people, wherever it's possible and legal, things evolve, things change. So it's okay to remove a poster that was put up a long time ago. Like they're, they're obsolete, the, the things have changed, someone forgot to take the poster down. So just like I pick up trash when I see it on the ground, if you see a poster that is now trash, um, the right thing to do for your society would be to, to help clean that stuff up. Uh, I've also seen a few people putting stickers that say personal lubricant over the dispensers of all that weird alcohol stuff people are doing. That seems really funny to me, but I would never do such a thing. So you're talking about the uh, san hand sanitizer <laughs> phenomenon that we're experiencing right now. Yeah, I just went to the mall this past weekend, or maybe it's last week, and I saw so many spots where they had hand sanitizers just pop like I, i'd never seen that before prior Dude, to this the virus isn't transmitted through touch C can we just say that again oh and smearing alcohol disrupts the microbiome of your skin and makes it so you absorb bpa a lot more from all those dumb receipts that you don't have to touch just tell them no you throw it away and bpa is an endocrine disruptor that is a provable problem in humans so why would I marinate in something that's bad for me and then use those newly opened cells against some kind of hormone disruptor to stop something that isn't transmitted through your skin? It's almost as dumb as replacing meat with something that looks like meat, but is made out of plants that makes you feel like crap and is more of an environmental burden than meat itself, which is what people are doing. So I'm just gonna say all of this has to do with hardware problems in our meat because thinking creatures would never do such a thing mm, yeah wow so we're we're not thinking right now we're we're reacting it as a matter of fact this is provable my other company is called 40 years of zen and we've got uh, 1500 brain scans of very high performance brains we, we do brain training and the brain is lazy when you don't have enough energy because your thyroid is low, because you're out of minerals, because you're eating the wrong stuff, you have blood sugar issues, you have blood flow issues, you have stress issues, all these things. The body says, I don't have enough energy to think all the way through. It'll just make you take thinking shortcuts. And this is why malnourished people who don't have enough minerals and don't have enough fat, or maybe don't even just have enough calories because they're eating too little and exercising too much, they're easy to program. 
because they don't have the electrical capacity to think it through. They're just too tired. And I can say this having weighed 300 pounds and had chronic fatigue syndrome. I was there. You're like, I'm just not going to think about it right now. That's not how we're supposed to be. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, again, this does, I, I love that we're having this conversation because this doesn't point to somebody who's not capable or who's a bad person. It's just become normalized to be in that state. You know, yep. I know that this is something that my mom would actually say this. And in my family, probably nine, 95% of my family members have one or more chronic diseases, right? So for me, at 20, I'm diagnosed with degenerative disc disease, yeah, right. an ar advanced arthritic condition of my spine. I'm a kid and low bone density where I broke my hip at track practice and asthma and all these other list of things. And my mother, obesity was very rampant in my family. But she would say this, especially as the years went on, when we would face a problem, like there's something coming up in the family or like with my school or something. She was like, Sean, I'm just tired. I'm tired. Yeah. You know, and so hearing that became it became our mantra, and I understand. And of course, you just want to be like, just get up, do something, do something about this. It's not that she can't; it's just so much more difficult when your biology is so dysfunctional and dysbiotic. You ever see a bullfight? Not not in person, Dave. No. Okay. Well, I've only seen one video, but what they do is they take a big, powerful, strong bull full of energy and life, and they put it in there, and they start chipping away at it. The goal of a bullfight, it's a cruel thing. It's not to just kill the bull, because you could do that easily. It's to piss the bull off until it collapses because it's too tired. Like So they'll put a you know, little knife in, a little knife in. It's, it's evil, right? How is it that this big, majestic, beautiful, strong creature eventually gets to the point that it's too tired to get up again if it can happen to a creature that powerful it can happen to us we just insert those knives in a different way mm -hmm. and we do it subtly and we actually have media designed to do that we have food designed to do that and it's okay to say i'm too tired because you actually are too tired and it's not a moral failing it's not because you're not trying hard I used to feel, especially in my late 20s, my career's taking off. I'm so excited. I've got the accelerator pressed all the way to the floor. And I'm slowing down. You're like, I'm going to press harder. Dude, there's nothing else to press. You got all the juice out of that orange. There's just nothing there. right? And that is a feeling of, of helplessness. It's, it's a feeling of almost terror. Like, what am I going to do? Right. In my case, I'm lucky. I did something. I had been very successful in my early career. I spent a million bucks getting healthier it, it should have cost me ten thousand dollars i just didn't know what to do we didn't have all the tech we didn't have all the knowledge we have now and that's what motivates me it's what motivates you too is that feeling of good god what am i going to do but it's the same thing your mom felt i'm just so tired like i don't know what to do but the knowledge that you're sharing man people don't have to be that tired you can fix the hardware and suddenly i got my energy back the fastest thing i know get your minerals up get your thyroid up get your sex hormones tested and get those up and all of a sudden at the end of the day like you know what? I'm less tired than I was yesterday. And you've got 10% more and you put that back in as an investment in to get even more. And then you have 20% more. And pretty soon you're like, holy crap, these are pants smaller than I would have worn in high school. And I got my brain back and I can think all day long and I can pay attention and I can see when people are telling me just bald ass lies. But mostly I just have inner peace and I'm calm because I'm actually dangerous again because I can handle my own stuff. You don't want to be peaceful because you're weak and too tired. You want to be peaceful because you chose peace. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of the quote that it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Damn straight. Yeah, man. So powerful. So this gets us to the actionable part of the conversation. You know, what do we do moving forward? Because I'm, I'm really grateful. I've been trying to find a way to articulate this because it's strange to say you're grateful for something that is so destructive but the past two years has really brought for me really highlighted something that you know you you hang around a lot of healthy people so we can tend to find ourselves in these bubbles mm -hmm. and we know externally that things are not going well but we don't really get it right and something like this bring it to the surface 
our susceptibility as a species really being the highlighted thing that's ignored. But this has been happening for decades now. There's been this decline mm -hmm. in our health and an increase in all manner of infectious diseases and chronic diseases. There's this misnomer that even our sophistication against infectious diseases has made them go down. No, they've been going up. And something is clearly awry. And so much so, just one of these statistics, I'm just gonna throw this one out here again. The rate of childhood obesity has tripled since oh, the 1980s. Scary. Tripled, right? Man. Something is severely wrong where this is the number one risk factor for poor outcomes from this particular virus that's been on everybody's mind. The number one risk factor. And our children are coming into this situation without even having necessarily a choice. They're just inundated with but, a culture that makes Let's it just happen. be straightforward. The number one risk factor for any infection is obesity. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter if it's the most famous infection or the flu or cancer or strep throat. It doesn't matter. If you're obese, you are less resilient. Hard stop. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out because what I wanna ask you about can we dig into why that is? Why is obesity this risk factor for, again, all manner of infectious and chronic diseases? It's pretty clear that our seed oil consumption has gone up hand in hand with obesity. There's also the destruction of our microbiome and soil by antibiotics that we only really started using in the 60s and 70s, just all over the place. I grew up I took antibiotics every month for a week because I had chronic strep throat because I lived in a house with toxic mold. So it used to be that I would have either solved the problem or moved, or maybe I wouldn't have made it, to be perfectly honest. But since we had all that medication, my gut still shows signs of someone who took antibiotics for a long period of time. Even worse, we're doing this in our animals. So the amount of saturated fat that we eat has gone down. Saturated fat accelerates your metabolism. And corn oil, soybean oil, seed oils slow your metabolism. This is provable. And I've written in my books about when you eat fat, which cells in the body incorporate it. It turns out your brain and your white fat are particularly susceptible to omega-6 oils. So maybe one of the big problems is what I did when I grew fat as a teenager. We knew butter was bad based on absolute BS science, as bad as the smoking and tobacco industry saying that uh, uh, smoking is good for you. Your doctor recommends it. Yeah. Your doctor also recommended squeeze margarine, which is what we replaced butter with. And I got fatter and fatter and had the brain issues and behavioral abnormalities and all these other things. Well, we've done this to ourselves as a species. I look at what they feed kids. In fact, I was in Austin and my Uber driver had been working for 30 years in school cafeterias managing the lunch program. I said, so what's hot these days? Like, what are you guys doing? And he goes, you know, these days, just a lot of wheat. Just 50% of what the kids eat is wheat. Because what we're doing is we're making human kibble. You literally go to the store and you buy a bunch of nuggets and you feed them to your dog and then your dog dies. In fact, golden retrievers used to live 18 years in 1970. They live 12 years now. And dogs are all fat and they have all these weird lipomas and cancers and stuff they didn't used to get. It's the kibble. We're feeding our kids kibble and we call it school lunches and McNuggets. Mm. We got to stop that. Uh, my kids eat animals that we raised or eat grass-fed stuff whenever they can. And they know if it's fried in seed oil, they don't eat it. They just don't eat it because it's not food. Every now and then... Uh, we'll take them out. Say, All right, we'll get the deep fried fish. We just did that. <laughs> like 20 minutes later, like, oh, my stomach hurts. I don't like this. And it's, it's not worth it. The thing is, you don't know it's not worth it if it's all you've ever known. Yeah. You know, if, if you're a kid who grew up, all you ate was Skittles and Starburst when you had a choice, you didn't eat the dark chocolate. <laughs> you didn't know that you eat the fat on the ribeye because that's the best part. How are you ever going to know what it's like to have good fat and good metabolism that comes from eating saturated fat? Well, that's a big part of the problem. I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was talking with Dr. Kate Shanahan. Yeah, and, oh, I like her. She's great. Yeah, and she was talking about when biopsies were done on human fat cells <sighs> back in the earlier part you know, of the 1900s, and the makeup of a fat cell was maybe around 2% 
polyunsaturated fatty acids. Whereas today, it's around 25% of the makeup of a fat right. cell. For white fat, yeah. Yeah, for white fat and specifically, yeah. It's funny, in, um, in cows, it's 1.6, in grass-fed cows, 1.6% polyunsaturated fats, which is why beef tallow is kind of the gold standard, or ghee, uh, for what you want to eat. And ghee just being clarified butter for people who haven't heard about ghee. So you're thinking if that's what we used to eat and that's what made us look like that, all you have to do is just watch, uh, remember that TV show Chips? Yeah. It yeah. was like the dumbest show ever, right? Uh, and it, it's full of, you know, sexism and all sorts of other stereotypes from the 70s. But what you'll find is they do a scene of the beach of just people walking around. Everyone looks, they're not like ripped like Arnold, but they just look lean. And it's just a normal look. And you realize today, we've so lost that. It's that. It's that seed oils plus all the chemicals we put in our environment that didn't exist back then. And glyphosate is a number one cause of that that we're not talking about enough. So drop the seed oils. And if it's palm oil, coconut oil, <laughs> or olive oil to a certain extent, you can eat it. If it's a fresh avocado, you can eat it. If it's a macadamia nut, you can eat it. But if you think seeds and nuts are gonna give you the kind of fats that you're made out of, you are sadly wrong. And certainly squeezing soybeans is provably bad for you. Canola oil, soybean, safflower, sunflower, all of those things, they are not in my nutritional profile. I have not eaten those foods in 17 years. Uh, the Bulletproof Diet, specifically tells you which animals to eat to get the best fat. Even chicken is high in omega-6 oil. Duck is better than chicken. Turkey is better than duck. Goose is better than turkey. Pigs are better than those if the pigs are fed right. And then you get lamb and goat and finally beef and buffalo and any wild game. That's what you want to eat. And we can, with the land we have now, produce this kind of food for the entire country. Because cows, they eat eat plants that we can't eat and they do it on land that doesn't have to be watered and plowed with environmental devastation in other words they walk around they everywhere they make healthy soil and they allow an ecosystem around them we can do this this is how all countries worked whether it's the big game in africa like elephants whether it's the buffalo that we had in the u.s well, we can go back to that, and it involves allowing animals with hooves to walk around so we can eat them. That's good. I'm so grateful you brought up the specifics, you know, soy oil, canola oil. These are, when I, when I mentioned the PUFAs earlier, the polyunsaturated fatty mm -hmm. acids are coming primarily from these industrialized seed oils. Absolutely. And they've become such a huge part. It's really difficult if you're eating processed foods to avoid them, period, right? And so that's what's making up the majority of our fat cells. No, it, it, it's not just a processed foods problem. This is really, It's a restaurant problem. So I, I've had right, my, right, right. my restaurant in Santa Monica open for eight years now. It's called the Upgrade Cafe. We've never used a seed oil. It's only <laughs> grass-fed ghee, coconut oil, uh, tallow, all, all the normal fats I just talked about. And it makes for more expensive food, but not more expensive than most restaurants in LA. You can turn a very small profit running a restaurant that makes food made with real oils because there's enough people who know about it that they'll drive across town to do it. I don't I don't want to eat at most restaurants because the meat is from industrial animals that are full of glyphosate and full of corn and soy because that's what they ate. And so you're getting these things and maybe antibiotics and maybe that zero and all. You don't really want to do that. And then they cook everything with canola oil. So you don't want to eat it. So like, I'll have the steamed rice. Can you saute some veggies, maybe in olive oil or butter? Uh, and then I try to choose the least harmful protein from the menu, right? That's kind of rough. And you don't want to do that on a regular basis. If you live at home and you're not on the road traveling, learn how to cook. You'll save so much money and you'll feel better. And grass-fed butter is still like the cheapest thing you could ever buy on a per calorie basis. It's, you know, four bucks for a pound of butter. Even if you're on a serious budget, you will spend less if you do eggs. And yes, organic free range eggs are better, but seriously, any egg is pretty decent. So you could do eggs and rice and some herbs and some butter. 
and it's going to not cost you very much. And if you can't afford the grass-fed meat, which is about a buck and a half a pound more if you buy it frozen, then get the non-grass-fed meat and have some activated charcoal with it, do your best, right? That is so much cheaper and you avoid all the bad oils. It's not very hard to cook it. You can do it in one pot if you want to. And if you don't know how to do it, Jesus Christ, like, don't you have YouTube? That's what adulting is. It's going to YouTube, figuring out how to do something by watching a video, then doing it yourself. You'll burn it a few times and then you'll learn how to cook a damned egg. It's not that hard. <laughs> I love that you brought up the the egg spectrum, you know, which any egg is going to be better than Hostess mini muffins, right? Because yeah. that can be a barrier to entry where it's just like, I can't get the expensive eggs. Just any real whole food is going to be so much more better for your biology. How, how about the fake eggs? It's like a highly processed plant-based product full of all these weird chemicals. And it's just eggs because no chicken squeezed an egg out. Like I have chickens. They squeeze eggs out every day, no matter what you do. And yes, there are chicken farms where they treat chickens horribly, but it's very easy to find eggs at a farmer's market. And usually you can find an egg dealer if you're at all suburban. And a lot of people are now starting to keep chickens. I would recommend giving the looming food shortages that appear to be intentional as far as I can tell. It's not that hard to have six chickens without a rooster in your backyard. They will make a shocking amount of protein and fat and they'll eat anything including your vegan neighbors when they don't have enough resilience. So there you go. All right. Let's get into <laughs> one more topic I want to ask you about. So this is tying in everything, which we were just talking about these omega-6 oils, mm -hmm. predominantly omega-6 already oxidized damaging oils. Let's talk about that connection between this substance and inflammation, because what we've been dealing with here is a virus that has this kind of pro-inflammatory interaction with the body. Are we getting into a pre-inflamed state by consuming so much of these highly processed oils? I, there's abundant evidence that having a higher amount of omega-6 fat creates inflammation. And the reason it does this is the body can use protein and fat as energy sources, protein is not a great energy source, by the way. It's expensive to make energy out of it. It creates a lot of byproducts. And you can use carbs for energy. But really, we're not made out of carbs. We have very, very few, like maybe 1% of us is carbs or less. So pretty much we're minerals, we are fat, and we're protein. So you eat these things, and the body says, all right, I got to burn some of them, and I've got to use the rest to make myself. Well, if you eat the omega-6s, the body says, shoot, I guess I got to make my cell membranes out of this. And omega-6s are called polyunsaturated because poly means you know, many. So there's multiple branches on these uh, fat molecules. And unsaturated means that they're waiting to receive uh, an electron. So what's going on here is these are things that provably are creating free radicals because they're just unstable. They're like, I gotta attract things to me, so they pull those things off of other things that creates a chain reaction. So you get a body that's more, in, more inflamed because of free radicals, but then you have these two big problems going on. One of them is toxic mold, we talked about before. The other one is the effects of the famous virus that shall not be named or the AI overlords will ban whatever we talk about. So everyone knows what I'm talking about. Both of those things in lots of studies now increase mast cell sensitivity. You know about mast cells? See, very few people do. I love it, you're super informed. So the way to think about these, mast cells are like landmines in your immune system. And as soon as something comes in and triggers a landmine, they explode, literally. They, it's called degranulation. And when they do that, they release histamine which everyone's heard of, and it causes allergies, all that sort of stuff. You take Benadryl, it's an antihistamine, it makes your allergies better. Well, they don't just release histamine. They release a hundred other inflammatory compounds, inflammatory cytokines, TNF, alpha, and just tons and tons of these things. When you get exposed to the virus or to toxic mold, and you have a body that's made out of omega-6s instead of the more stable saturated fats and some monounsaturated. What you end up with is when one of the landmine goes off, 
the trigger gets set so it goes off way too easily. That's what the virus is doing. That's what mold exposure does. And when it goes off, it sets off all the landmines around it. So you get these like waves of inflammation that go through there. And that inflammation shows up as anxiety, depression, bipolar, back pain, rashes, persistent cough, brain fog, vertigo, all these weird things. And you go to all these different specialists. This is a foundational thing that's happening. And it's funny that long C word and toxic mold exposure have almost identical long-term effects. And it's because of this mast cell issue. So if you wanted to have stable mast cells, the first thing you do is build your body out of good fats. The good news is you can do it. The bad news is that the half-life of fat in the human body is about two years. That means if you start eating good fat right now, so you're gonna do your butter, your egg yolk, your beef tallow, things like that. After two years, 50% of your cell membranes, which are all made out of little droplets of fat, will be replaced with a healthier composition. And if you do another two years, you'll be 75% good fats. And if you go from there, obviously it gets better and better. And it's funny, most people, when they call it go bulletproof, when they first started drinking bulletproof coffee, when I first came out with this, just like me, the first two years, like, oh my God, I can't get enough butter. Give me like eight tablespoons a day. Like I just, oh, and, and it's this need. Like I'm finally, and what you're doing is you're restoring all the broken cell membranes from being a vegan, which is what you and I both had done um, because vegan diets provably have all omega-6 fats in them. So eventually after two years, you just wake up one day, like, I just want a tablespoon. Like you finally got enough to flush through all the bad stuff and the body's like, yes. And it's like a celebration of saturated fat. It's okay if you feel that way when you eat the ribeye. It just means you need more ribeye and you need more eggs if you're not allergic to them and you need more of that butter. And eventually you're like, all right, I got my metabolism back. I got my equilibrium back. You just have to listen to your body. If you want to sing a song after you ate the steak, you need more steak. (laughs) <laughs> oh man you just shared so much you know so many incredible insights you also touched on these omega sixes and anxiety and i wanted to we'll throw this up on the screen for everybody this was just published a couple months ago and the title of the study was the relationship between linoleic acid intake and psychological disorders in adults published in frontiers and nutrition prestigious medical journal And again, more scientists are asking these questions, but it takes folks to come along and to question the the prevailing paradigm. And that's something that I really admire about you and I appreciate because especially at times like this, when the tension can be high, we can have a tendency to coil up and to hide out and to not speak up and to share our perspective and to critical think. And you've been promoting that since the beginning. And I really appreciate that about you. Can you let everybody know where they can connect with you more, follow you, get their hands on some of your coffee? Absolutely. And and thanks for the compliment. And I admit it, I I am a dangerous person uh, because I have enough power to do this because I have my energy back. So dangercoffee.com is where you can try the new coffee. It's outstanding coffee and you will get your daily minerals the way you wanted to and you'll feel different from the first cup even if you drink it black. This stuff is totally legit. My podcast is The Human Upgrade and you've been on, I don't know, how many times? It's, it's been a while. It's been a long time but you're going to come on again soon. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, let's see, I know I write books and you'll find me on Instagram and all that kind of stuff. Just Dave Asprey, you'll find me everywhere. Yeah, man, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming by. And also, you've got a big event. One of the most epic events is coming up next week. So as of this recording, people would have missed this one. But whenever you hear about a biohacking conference coming up, come out, attend. The the lineup of speakers, so many people, friends who've been on this show, who've been sitting in that chair, are going to be there speaking, coming out, just to come and hang out, period. It's a really great place to connect with some great thinkers oh thank you biohackingconference.com people can sign up for next year actually and this is my favorite event of the year because you get a community of people like us we all get to hang out and just realize you know what we're not alone there are millions of people who are owning their own biology who are just saying you know what i don't care what all the weird people are doing right now i'm just going to do the things that work and I'm gonna measure it, and I'm gonna do what works even better. And that's what you've done. You brought yourself back from degenerative disc disease. 
I did the same thing with my brain, with my obesity. Everyone listening has that power to do it and maybe something in the show is going to help them get that spark so they can get it started hey if you like this video make sure to check out this video right here and you see that your blood sugar goes up 80 points which would be a really high rise you can say immediately in in one time of just checking this food with your continuous glucose monitor this food is likely causing a big insulin surge in me and we know that one of the many functions of insulin is that it blocks fat burning in the body 